on today's show. It's part one of a two-part mega media day recap. I want to thank you for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. That includes YouTube. Please hit subscribe on there if you have not already. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. All right, the music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Spotify, Apple Music. I'm Chris Manning covering the Cavs and NBA at large for places like Diamond Up Rocks and Estimations for the Sword. My co host is Evan Damerel at Fear the Sword as well, but primarily at Meta's right down Euclid. We are about a week away from preseason basketball, but today. Is the this I what I what I call the bread before the appetizer that is preseason basketball. This is media day. We're gonna do two full episodes coming into your feed both on Tuesday to recap everything we heard, or at least most of what we heard. We're saving some of the some of it for episodes later in the week. But Evan, I, I think there's only one place for us to start here, and that's with expectations. I, I don't think they went out of their way as an organization, a, as a team. And really playing up expectations. I don't think they really played up so much, you know, that this is championship robust. Kobe Allman explicitly did say that this is not championship robust as he did at the Donovan Mitchell press conference. But I think there was both an acknowledgement that they're not going to catch teams off guard anymore. And that I think with the Mitchell trade, there is, I think, an inter- internal expectation of... Like you gotta, you gotta do some stuff, and like a, there was a lot said about like you know we could have won fifty games last year if not for all the injuries we had, and that was obviously before they they acquired Donovan Mitchell. Yeah, and it, I, I'll put it this way: like you said, they they aren't necessarily shying away from the fact that hey, they were kind of crowned as one of the offseason champs this year. I mean, I guess just them and the Minnesota Timberwolves being opportunistic and picking the corpse of the Utah Jazz always works out for you, but um. I, I like you said, they aren't shying away from it, but they also aren't really going full steam ahead. Where it, it's a different kind of set of expectations. It's not like LeBron just came back through the door and is going to try and steer this team back towards the NBA Finals and possibly a championship. Um, GB Bickerstaff really said, and I was transcribing the audio before we started talking. JB Bickerstaff said. We didn't accomplish anything last year. We improved and got better, but we didn't win a championship. We didn't make the playoffs. So there's no reason for us to have that, not have that same spirit as in talking with an underdog mentality. You don't change who you are because of expectations. What we were last year wasn't a fluke, so it was a combination of personalities and characteristics of our guys. So a summer shouldn't change that in regards to the Donovan Mitchell trade. Our mentality shouldn't change by any means. And I think that's the right disposition to have because this is a Cavs team who's incredibly young. Um, I noted this as well as like one of my broad takeaways was, yeah, there's a lot of veterans of this team, but they're really going to be leaning on these younger players to be like the voice of both on and off the floor for them at times. And that's, that's going to probably be tough at first and we'll see what happens. Um, I was at the media event after the fact and someone at the Cavs organization said, they're like, Hey, we haven't won a single game yet, but this is an exciting time. And, um, Let's just see what happens. You got to go with game one, then you look at game two and game three, and eventually you build some momentum. And then maybe you start to look down the line at the playoffs a little bit, but focus on what's ahead of you first. And I think that's just kind of the mindset the Cavs are, where they may live in Ohio, but presently they live in the moment. Yeah. And I'm curious to see, Evan, how that like evolves as we go here. Like, how do they feel this? I mean, Kevin Love talked about. Kevin Love sort of echoing I like the some of the the stuff he said in the past and some of the the references that like they I think of what he's been through in the LeBron era just coming from from that was like look like you're going to get more national TV games you're going to get more people here you're going to get expectation and we're going to find out like what we're made we're made of as a team right and I think like I think broadly it seemed to me like there is an understanding that that's coming and I think like obviously this team is is sort of young um, you know, Donovan Mitchell is like sort of the old guy of the of the potential four all stars, and he's twenty six. He just turned twenty six like a week or two ago. Like he's not old, and 
like Kevin Love is like the old head and like Robin Lopez is the old head, but it's like this is a group that is we're gonna find out all I think a lot about them this season, I think more than than anything else. And that that to me feels like what the expectations are. It's like I think if you see what you know what Evan Mobley had to say, we're not like, you know, the most robust guy, and we'll talk about him a lot today, but Darius Garland Mitchell at his introductory presser, he did not speak at at Media Day because he just did that presser. Um, Kevin Love, you know Ricky Rubio, like the I think that Altman and Bickerstaff, even with with Altman downplaying some of the title or bus expectations, I think like this group feels like it kind of needs not not needs that's maybe strong, but like there is I think a desire to find out like what this is all about, what this group can kind of do. Um, obviously, we didn't hear from like everyone in a big picture sense. There's other guys I'd be kind of on the role player side um, that I'd like to hear more from. You know, Isaac Okoro being one. You know, Karis Levert talked a little bit, but there's there, we'll see how he kind of does this year. There's a lot of just to, let's like let's be the man in the arena, so to speak, and like let's see where this kind of goes. Is kind of the v- broad vibe I got from this. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's kind of the mentality of a lot of these Cavs players, whether it's just individually, like with Isaac Okoro, he's got to prove that he can be a functional player offensively, or if you're Karis LeVert, you have to prove that you are worth a contract extension after it was kind of put out in the ether that he was interested in signing one of the Cavs after he was traded here. There's a lot of things individually, but another broad takeaway for me is just like it's, it's, a, it's a sports cliche, but it's not about me. It's about we for these Cavs players, and they really want to like see each other succeed. They want to see them at the best of their ability. They want to kind of make that push, uh, build out of that shadow even further, build out even further from the shadow of LeBron James and just like the long, long legacy he has left behind him in Cleveland and really just be that first playoff team that has made the playoffs since the 97-98 season without him. And I think that's definitely something to take pride in. And then you, once you get there, maybe make some noise and then build off that success and momentum because Alden did note this as he was kind of downplaying the significance of things is they have a bit of a runaway at Donovan Mitchell's contract. They have a runaway at Jared Allen's and Darius Garland's contract. We'll assume Evan Mobley will be in this mix as well too, down the line too. Um, the Cavs, and also there's age in this factor as well, too. So the Cavs have, like, an interesting just way to kind of go about things. Like, yes, the goal should be to make the playoffs this season. But, again, like Altman said, it isn't championship or bust. You build upon the success you have this season. Maybe see what didn't work, what does work. And then you build upon what did work towards what you're trying to form as maybe other teams age out in the Eastern Conference and as you level up because your younger players continue to grow and just transcend as they've had uh, so far in their career. The one thing I will say, and this is more of an opinion thing than anything that what they said, it is that I think we have to remind ourselves, I think, and think about that these windows can be shorter than they they would seem. You know, like I, I was when I was writing up the Dean Wade news, which we'll we'll talk about in the second episode, uh, his extension. You look at the twenty five twenty six cap sheet. the The names on that cap sheet are Donovan Mitchell if he picks up his player option. Dean Wade, Darius Garland, and Evan Mobley, assuming he's on the rookie extension. That's it, right? And, like, having, like, Allen and Garland and those guys sort of, like, locked up and, the, and having the inside track on Mitchell is, like, a very big yeah. deal, right? But, like, yeah. this roster will change. Other things will – like, just this will, ne- this will always just continue evolving, getting pushed. No matter if you say – like, if they say they have the runway, and I, I think – you know, I don't think this is a championship team. I think this could be a very good team. I, I'm cur- I, I think they have to prove some stuff to get to that championship level. And I, I do not think this season a championship or bust, but I, I, I'm curious to see just how this – let's just say it ends up becoming a diamond. How does that diamond get molded by pressure? How does that diamond – in this environment get molded by what is to come this year. I think this is like the tone center of that. And then being kind of, I think eager is kind of an interesting place for us to put, to, to say, okay, this is what it was like September 26th before things pop off. What is it like in January? What is it like? And how, what is the tone as this kind of goes on? Yeah, I I agree with that a hundred percent. I think that's just kind of the right way to go about things because you don't want to, like you said, pressure makes a diamond into an even more brilliant diamond, and the Cavs are are a diamond right now in the rough of last season, and they are certainly facing public expectations and pressure, and maybe internally, like they, they think they're feeling cool, calm, and collected, but like they have to see how they respond to it because as we saw last season, they didn't do well at times and they responded to pressure, and that's just mostly due to circumstances outside of their own control. But 
there's a lot of interesting things and in ways this Cavs season could go, but I think they have the right disposition and mentality heading into training camp in the preseason that eventually the regular season. Yes. All right. After the break, we're going to move on to Evan Mobley, who spoke for the first time since the end of last season uh, at mid availability, looking kind of looking a little more jacked, a little thicker, but unsure of how many pounds he put uh, on. Thick jacked frame. Uh, RIP to the great podcast by Trevor McNaughty. Well, also the Boston Celtics Twitter, bit, which is where that came from. But uh, well, yes, yes. yes. All right. All right, we're going to talk about Evan Mobley after this. But first, going to tell everyone about our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchup news, and podcasts, including the upcoming slate of games either Saturday or Sunday. Bet Online is also your continued source for your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It is the fastest and easiest way to check in at all your favorite sports and events, including the NBA, MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. For instance, Evan Mobley, who we're about to talk about, is plus 1,600 to win Defensive Player of the Year. The Cavs over under, meanwhile, is set at 46.5, and that went up after they acquired Donovan Mitchell. Bet online where the game starts. Check them out today for all of your sports betting interests. Okay, we are back here on Locked On Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Damrell. Uh, I would be remiss just at the top of the segment. Go check out Locked On Browns and Locked On Guardians. A lot of other things are happening in the Cleveland sports scene right now. Uh, Locked On Browns obviously will be covering the Miles Garrett news and, and his unfortunate, the car accident he was unfortunately in. The Guardians just won the division. Jeff House will be clean there. And check out the Ultimate Cleveland Sports. They were on site at Cavs Media Day. Shots to shots to McNuggets holding it down, asking some fun questions uh, for, for them. All right. I, I was a model for McNuggets today. All I was, he called me a dummy, and he meant in the sense that I had to frame the camera for them because they had Donovan Mitchell on. So check that out. Yes. Shots to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports. Okay. Evan, Evan Mobley spoke. Wasn't the, you know, it was a typical Evan Mobley discussion. It wasn't the longest, most robust uh, thing in the world. He's a very, you know, reserved guy. But what, what popped to you in terms of what he had to say? I mean, other than the fact that he is noticeably more mature looking physically, like he cl clearly put on muscle mass this off season and, um, I don't think we have like his official weight in front of us quite yet, but he, he does certainly look bigger. And he said that he added a lot of muscle in the off season. But what stuck out to me is the fact that he kind of mentioned it. No one really pressed him on it other than the fact that he, a lot of people did ask about the shooting, to be fair to that. He said he's going to be taking a lot more threes this year because he feels like he's out of that part of the offensive flow for Cleveland within to his repertoire, but more so the fact that he mentioned that he's going to bring be bringing the ball up more and initiating the offense a little bit and kind of being like point mobility, which is something you and I have kind of advocated for is using him as a, an interesting piece to initiate the offense for the Cavs. I, so much of what he discussed, so much of what he had to say, I, I think was skewed towards the offense. I think like we will get in and we're going to do another Mobley segment after this. And, and we're going to talk about like kind of the praise, I think thrown at him from, from Almond and Baker staff, especially and, and hitting how special they, they believe he can be. I kind of, I also just think like it was interesting to see the, the, the level, it wasn't like the most detailed stuff in the world, but yeah. like him kind of outlining like what he had to say about his offensive game, I was was interesting. I mean, I think the the hitting on the transition stuff that you did, I think, is the place to start because, like, we saw him do that some last year. You will see him get rebounds and go, and like he has the vision, he has the the because his legs are so freaking long, he can get up yeah. court and go, and he has the vision to make that stuff happen. That's going to add some dynamicism, I think, to the Cavs' offense that will help, and I think it's good for him to get those reps. I think especially as he gets stronger, like we've seen. Uh, a certain guy who plays for the Bucks, like really excel by pushing, pushing on the break and, and using his frame and, and getting to those spots. He also didn't just say like I, I the the questions were about three pointers. He went out of his way to talk about pull ups and facilitating yeah. from the elbow and and doing other stuff that isn't threes. He did talk about threes, scratched but he's also for one Chris Manning. <laughs> well, it, it it scratched an itch because 
when we had we people can go back and listen to we did an I did an episode with Jackson Frank about Mobley's offense development and I had spent way too much time in retrospect thinking about the threes. The threes matter. I, I'm not gonna say they don't. It's an interesting skill and a swing skill for him. There's also just like if he's just better at some of the stuff he did last year, he becomes like a much more effective offensive player. Like if he's just making more pull ups and he's more confident in his strength and getting to his spots and things, like you will see. I think you will see an offensive leap from Mobley if just the basic stuff he outlined that isn't three pointers just improves. And it's just like, oh, Evan Mobley's like kind of good on offense now. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Like we, we talked about this a little bit, and the episode with Jackson is a good place for people to kind of go with what you're hoping to see from Evan Mobley heading into this year. But when we touched base on like a player review at the end of last season, really, you really smartly put like, "Hey, Evan Mobley doesn't have like a ton of in his offensive bag." Like the honest comparison is kind of good if you're a bag Twitter head too, but. The fact that he acknowledged like different ways that he can impact this team offensively, and it's just more so than like, scoring on the interior, like that's certainly refreshing to hear. And I think the fact that he uh, he's a soft spoken kid, he kind of lets his game speak for himself. He leads by example in that regard. But like the fact that he was even hyping up his own three point shot a little bit, like kind of maybe gives you a glimpse into the fact that like Evan Mobley is kind of humble he's just not he's kind of real with people too and the fact that like he doesn't really try to like really sell himself too high he just is very present at things but when he's like talking like hey i've been really working on my three-point shot this summer like i've been working with my personal trainer i've been working with uh greg buckner and luke walton on my shooting this summer as well and other coaches on the cleveland's coaching staff too like there's something here the fact that he as Chris mentioned, in multifaceted ways, like wants to kind of impact Cleveland shooting wise. If that's like a real thing that is sustainable and sticks for him with the Cavs, like their offensive lineup is really, really, really lethal because that's just going to get even more space for Jared Allen to operate in the interior as well. Mobley, maybe it's just because like defense is harder to talk about and offense is like fun and we put so much weight on that end of the floor. I think that's certainly part of it. Yeah, I I think like so much of the intrigue about Mobley now is just like, what does he do offensively? And it, that that feels like where we're going to spend a lot of mental energy on his leaps. And like we have to keep track of the defensive leaps because I think there's there's more to come. And um, it certainly seems like the plan to some degree defensively is like run it back and have Mobley and Allen do Mobley and Allen things, and and we'll see where that goes. But it, it's. I will be very intrigued to just see like what he looks like in the like Mitchell seeing Mitchell in a preseason game in a Cavs uniform will be obviously noteworthy and cool. And but like we know what Mitchell is in terms of like what players look different. If Mobley's like doing stuff in preseason game number one, I think like that that's where we I think it's we can we can get a little excited, get a little intrigued by like what what's to come there with Evan Mobley. Like you said, he's a, he's a bit of an alien on defense to begin with. I think we need to see some of that. Not weirdness, but truly uniqueness. Like, I hate the term unicorn, but, like, Evan Mobley truly is a very unique player, and especially just as such a young prospect. Like you said, defense is a little bit more nuanced, a little bit harder to talk about. Some of its eye tests, some of its metrics, and offense is just kind of easier to digest and kind of just feed to our listeners at times, too. But, like, Mobley already having such a cerebral impact on the defensive side of the ball in his rookie season, and it's natural to assume he's going to get even better this upcoming season. But the fact that he's just really zeroed in on saying, like, hey, I've worked on X, Y, and Z offensively, and I want to add more to my game, and I want to grow, and I hope the coaching staff can kind of, like, enable me and empower me, which I think they probably will if it's a strength in two of his game and just, you know, accentuates what Cleveland's trying to do. Like, that's just really exciting. And... Mobley's like trajectory could be going even higher than expected sooner than expected too, because we talked about this a little bit when we had Martin Rickman on getting Donovan Mitchell kind of alleviates some of the offensive pressure that Evan Mobley has to execute with. But if he's really ready to go like from game one against Toronto and Toronto, like this changes things quite a bit for not just Mobley, but the Cavs as well. He did look bigger too. I just want to like emphasize that he looks bigger. Yeah, he looks bigger. He, I had a, a member of Cleveland's front office described me over the summer, like just during like workouts. And I believe Kobe Altman noted that like Mobley more or less lived in Cleveland for the majority of the summer, just like using the practice facility all the time. Mm -hmm. But they said like early into the summer, like 
he was working a lot. And I think maybe just having to go through the full rigors in NBA season put things in perspective for him. And it also just showed like, hey, I need to get bigger, faster, stronger. And yeah, he, he just looks better. He looks like a grown man. Like that's how the front office staff have described it. He looks like a grown man. <laughs> Yeah, they talked about like bigger staff working out with it, uh, him out, going visiting him the land, then bonding. I'm throwing up a tweet here from front of the program, Jordan Zerm. Uh, that is the the first thing that came when I searched Evan Mobley on Twitter. His arm, look, look at his arms. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see this, but they look bigger. Yeah, they do, and it's crazy to think he's still only in his second year. Like he's. I'm telling you, man, if he gets on that Giannis like workout plan, but maybe not as not as bulky, just so he has a little bit of that finesse and is able to become a bit, a, a, a still be able to be like a fluid shooter, like yeah. the Cavs are in a good good spot. Yes, that that leads us into our last break and is a good segue to us. Where I kind of think one of the more interesting things that was said by Bickerstaff and Altman as a group is the same word superstar with with Evan Mobley and and where yeah. they think he said it. We'll talk about that after this. All right, last segment here on Locked on Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Damerell. Evan, here's, here's my take on, on, on what is said here. And, and broadly, I think one of my things I believe about what this 2022-23 Cavs season will be in a lot of ways. That, like, Mitchell obviously, again, is the excitement. He is bona fide. They've talked. They, there's a lot of talk about what he's accomplished. It's it. It is very evident how many of these guys are excited to play with Donovan Mitchell, and like, uh, how many of them were just coincidentally working out when they when they heard about the trade. Um, uh, well, no, Jared Allen was napping, which you know I respect it. I I do respect that he was napping. That everyone else was like, oh yeah, I was you know I was in the gym. I'm like okay, respect. But they. Kobe Allman, I believe, used the word superstar in describing what Evan Mobley could be. And they talked about, like, could he contend for all defense all defense this year? He should have he contended for it last year. Probably should have made it. And contending for defensive player of the year in short order. I think they are, it was, like, very clear that it's like, look, we know we got Donovan Mitchell. We know we have Darius Garland. We know we have Jared Allen. Like, the Mobley thing just feels so centered on, like, how high this... this how high the ceiling of the Cavs is going to be. And it seems like the organization to some degree, right? Like, I don't want to take this as like, this is what they believe hundred percent, whatever. I think it is telling that they came out and were so effusive and using kind of big words and big accolades for Evan Mobley. And I think it's very clear that like their plans for hitting their, their ceiling and smashing through the ceiling is the roof is all about Evan Mobley being like a super duper star. Yeah, I think um, J.B. Bickerstaff saying like he could be flirting with Defensive Player of the Year honors and Kevin Love saying that there's four all-stars of this roster and that's including Evan Mobley in that. And the fact that a lot of people were refusing praise upon Evan Mobley and just saying like this kid's a superstar, like Kobe Allen was kind of, you know, banging his chest a little bit saying, you know, they, they really were fortunate to be able to draft him. But the fact that he's just kind of so committed to improving as a player and just becoming – arguably the face of the franchise in the next few seasons really is surreal to think about. And it's going to be cool to see the Cavs have a player that is so multifaceted and so just uniquely special on both ends of the floor. And like, I I'm curious to see where he's at. I agree that he should have been floating with all defensive honors last year and probably should have gotten them. And, it doesn't feel unrealistic now just based on what his body of work says for us in his rookie year and his NBA season, just kind of like assuming natural growth and trajectory and just everything else. So like he could really be like one of the best defensive players in the league this season. It's just, uh, I'm going to, this is from, I Cleveland Magazine had this up and I'm just going to read you it. This is Evan Mobley had the most Evan Mobley quote of all time when asked about Donovan Mitchell. Quote, I was working I was in the gym working out and some person in the gym randomly shouted that we got Donovan Mitchell and I was like, What? And then I was like, Oh shoot, and started texting people and stuff and saw who got traded. I was excited when it happened and I think it's gonna be a great year. That is like the most Evan Mobley like reserved Evan Mobley comments you could possibly have about this stuff, but it's he you know, he's he's just gonna like do Evan Mobley things and we'll be like that guy's really freaking good. Um I mean, there's some. We'll hit on some smaller stuff as we go. 
is there is there anything like from Altman else that stood out to you? Anything else in particular from him? Because we he he will we're going to talk about Bickerstaff to open up segment uh, podcast number two covering Media Day. But was there anything else from Altman that kind of stood out to you and kind of thinking back to what he said? Um, not necessarily. I think him kind of just really reaffirming the fact that the Cavs just aren't really championship or bust right out the gate. So kind of temper public expectations from some folks is, is a good thing. And I don't know, there wasn't much meat on the bone for what Kobe Altman had to say other than just like what we've kind of already known about these guys, but what he said about Evan Mobley is certainly refreshing. What about you? I think the championship or bust thing was a big deal. And I I also think it is interesting that something they harped on a lot last year that they kind of went out of their way to bring up today was the culture stuff again and JB yeah, and, J, and JB true. being really and JB being really responsible for that. Again, like we need to see how some of that stuff like holds up under pressure, how that sort of adapts as the year goes. Different people, like I I think again we need to see how that actually sustains before we crown it like a, a full on success or whatever. But I think if you the with the way they talk about it, in particular, I think the way JB talks about it feels like very G, very genuine to me. That they are just like, we only want a certain kind of person, and I think like that does matter. And it also just seems like the way they are talking about Donovan Mitchell is that like Mitchell is buying into a lot of what they kind of feel like they established last year, and I think that is key to this whole thing working as well. Yeah, when you bring in a top 20, 25 player like Donovan Mitchell, there are going to be concerns about just like maybe rocking the boat on the outside looking in. But I think the Cavs did do their due diligence and did do their homework on the fact that like this is a guy that will accentuate the culture that they have in the building. And also, like you said, to Altman's credit, like he really did heat praise on J.P. Bickerstaff. But if you believe in your heart of hearts, your culture is as rock solid as you think it is, you're willing, you're more than willing and probably more comfortable to take these kind of swings to go get a star to kind of accelerate things a little bit for you rebuild wise. Yes. All right. We'll be uh, back with another media day recap in, in podcast number two, JB Bickerstaff talking about scheme, Dean Wade, his extension and texting his grandmother and Jared Allen uh, talking about Larry Markin as well as Dylan Windler maybe seeming a little bit more confident. That's all going to come up in the next episode of Lockdown Cavs. I want to thank you again for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. This episode was produced by Jake Stevens. For a second great listen today, check out Lockdown Fantasy Basketball. Josh Floyd hosts the number one daily fantasy basketball show on the planet. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. I'm Chris. That's Evan. Everyone. What's up? Be well. We'll talk to you again here very shortly. Just go click the next episode right away. It's that easy. We're two for one today. Let's get it.